Good morning, everybody. Welcome to February. It's a brand new month. Um, and I'm a planner. I love to plan. I was thinking this morning, I was like, what am I going to wear tomorrow? I know, I know it sounds weird. But let's see, tomorrow, 2nd of February. I got it. I'm going to wear a tutu. A two, two. For <laughs> February the 2nd. <laughs> Oh, that's speaking to my ballet background. I love it. I love it. I'd have to find me a tutu first, but I have a feeling I could. <laughs> we can borrow one of mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 1st of February and to Wednesday, where Tara and I talk everything relationships and communication. Before we get started, I'm going to ask a few questions. I want to talk to Sorrel first. Sorrel, how are you and who are you going to hug today? I was hoping you'd ask me what I'm grateful for. And what are you grateful for? <laughs> <laughs> I am happy, and that's the way I say I am. I'm going to hug my grandson. Mm. And I'm grateful for knowing what to wear tomorrow. I'm going to wear a tutu. <laughs> I need a picture. I'm going to need a picture of that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's great. Thank you, Sorrel. Chase. Chase, Chase, I would like to know, where are you? And I, I don't know what you're grateful for, too. Oh, yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm right here in, in the place. I'm right, right here in the moment, in the present. Um, I'm actually grateful for my father today. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you, Chase. What a father downloads. Yeah. I love it. Andrea, I want to finish off with you. What time is it? The only time, Catherine, now. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you. Now that we are here and now, I am going to turn it over to my dear friend, Tara, to talk to us about how to make a monologue interesting. Yes, and engaging. Thank you. And thank engaging. You. Yeah. So thank you, Catherine. Um, you know, we talked about how we might want to shift the conversation a little bit. And um, I said, you know, I haven't shared any of my talk to the brain tips in a while. And so we're going to focus a little bit on communication today. And I bet there is not a person in this virtual room who has not at some time or other been asked to speak. Maybe five minutes, maybe 30 minutes, maybe to a small group, maybe to a large group. And there are some challenges if we do not have the opportunity to have dialogue. So I ask you this, what would be more powerful to make your message more impactful? Is it more powerful to have a dialogue or is it more powerful to have a monologue? Sorrel? I say dialogue. Okay, I would tend to agree with that because you can learn to listen to the other person, understand their perspective, and lean into what their needs are, right? Makes the most sense. And how many, as long as we've been on this earth, how many times have we been taught and trained to be a good listener, to be a better listener, to learn to listen better? And so if we are asked to provide a monologue, how do we do that? How do we engage the other people when we can't speak to them? Because there are settings where we actually are asked to give a monologue. Here are some examples, and these would be different, but here are some examples of why we would need to give a monologue. It's an audience of 2,000, right? You're not going to be able to have dialogue with those folks. You can, you can ask questions, but you're not going to actually engage with the audience because it would blow your whole talk. <laughs> um, or if someone says, you know, we only have a group of 10 people. We want you to speak on your superpower, your area of expertise, and you have five minutes. So if you take two of those minutes to ask questions and understand the audience, that leaves you only three to share your superpower. So in those settings, those are times when a monologue is going to be the most effective. 
So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the minds of listeners. Most of you know, but some of you don't, that I have uh, devoted, it's now been over 18 years of my life to the study of neuroscience. And I was a sales professional, a sales leader, a speaker. I provided workshops for many years. And when my daughter um, was struck with a virus that caused a traumatic brain injury, that's what sparked my study of the brain. And I share this to let you all know that that is how I developed my Talk to the Brain platform. Because as I studied the brain on behalf of my daughter's health, I continued and continued and continued to have these aha moments of, wow, that's why these strategies work, why these are effective. This is how we can communicate better. And that's why maybe some don't. So let's start with the brain. Let's start with the brain and how it may or may not be conditioned for a monologue. Our brain has a negativity bias in it that goes way back to when men and women were in caves. And when we first experience someone or something, we are going to react to it without thinking. And it used to be, you all know this, there was that fight or flight mode, right? Where people were either running for, they were going to fight, flight, or freeze in order to protect themselves, to stay alive, to get food, and to have shelter. Well, that still exists in our brain today, but we use it in a completely different way because most of us are not running for our lives. But you know what we're running from? We're running from fear. Our brain today, we fear, and what are we fearing? There's a couple things that we fear today, especially when we sit down and we're asked to put our phone away and listen to a speaker. We fear boredom. That's one thing that we are afraid that we're going to be forced to be stuck, not being able to stimulate our brain. And it's worse today than ever before because of all the ways that we can tap into instant gratification and stimulation, mostly through screens. So the one thing we want to make sure we do is not bore people. And the best way to do that is to not start any talk with the very predictable, hi, how are you? I'm glad to be here. Those things are nice to say. Don't start with those. Start with something very surprising, very unpredictable, and that will help people to lean in and think, hey, this might not be boring. What else do people fear when they sit down and listen to a speaker? They fear the unknown. We don't want to feel like we don't know, like we're not already in charge. That feels scary. We're, we're asking people to change. So if we know that our listeners are fearing change and the unknown, there's some really powerful stories, um, really powerful strategies that help us to wipe away those fears. So people fear boredom. That's an easy one to overcome. You just want to be unpredictable and creative. People fear change and the unknown. People fear someone who comes over as knowing all the answers and seeming somewhat arrogant. So how do we affect that? How do we let people know that we understand what's in their minds and that they may be uncomfortable? The most powerful strategy to use to overcome that in the minds of our listeners is to tell a story and to make it vulnerable. And if you know me at all, you hear me talk about this all the time. I saw a beautiful example of someone doing exactly that. And it was just yesterday when I was on the Daily Huddle with Chase Steele. I did not know that was your name. Chase Steele Gray. And the gentleman that was speaking, was his name Daniel? He told a very vulnerable story, something that did not put him in a good light. And it really, really ingratiated the audience to him. It didn't make us feel like we're sitting here listening to a know-it-all. He did it early on and it was relatable. So when we tell stories about ourselves that don't necessarily put us in a good light, that feels vulnerable. But it also helps us to show the audience without telling them. It helps us to show them and let them experience that we can change and learn and grow. And we do that by showing that from ourselves first. Now, here's something interesting. Catherine, you and I have talked a lot about vulnerability. And we've been working to bring vulnerable, authentic stories to the daily huddle. Um, there is a challenge, though, as, as the word vulnerability, and who can tell me who was who the queen of vulnerability? Who really got the word rolling in America? Brene Brown. You got it, Brene Brown. She is the queen of vulnerability. She, she says she's a scientist and she studies shame. <laughs> um, there we go, Brene Brown. 
Thank you. Um, as more and more people have tried to understand vulnerability and encourage themselves to be vulnerable, it's a little bit dangerous. And I'll tell you what has happened at times is that we tend to, when we want to tell a vulnerable story, we end up talking about ourselves maybe a little bit too much. So that's a fine line. Yes, we want to tell stories. It's You can't really tell a vulnerable story unless you're part of it, right? But there are other stories. You can tell stories about other people, things that you've witnessed that are inspiring. Those are also very powerful strategies. But when we tell stories about ourselves, who is the hero in the story? Well, it depends, but I would imagine that we are most of the time, especially when we're vulnerable. We are. And when we tell a vulnerable story, who we want to make the hero is the listener. Mm, gotcha. We want to have the mindset that we are there to serve. We are there to give. Mm. For me, I always, before I approach any audience, I remind myself, as a matter of fact, I have a little like invisible mantra. I wrap my arms around the audience, like in my mind, and I, I'm there to love and to give. A lot of people call it serve, but for me, the word love means something to me. And if I keep myself in that mode, then it keeps me vulnerable. It keeps me authentic and it helps the listener to trust me. And when we start to build trust, oxytocin builds in the minds of the listener. When they start to feel that we're relatable and they can trust, then they're going to lean in because they feel safe and they can relate. That I love sense? that. I want to pause you really quick, Tara, because you do this inherently and naturally because I, I can relate to it as you're saying it. But give us an example of how the listener is the hero. Because that's like, I can hear it. And I'm like, but then how do I actually do that? You know, how do I tell my story and make them the hero? That's an awesome question. I love it. And as a matter of fact, I just uh, wrote a speech for someone recently and we worked on it. We worked on it and she has some really powerful stories. Um, but at the end of the day, it had to be about the audience. So here's a little here's a little trick that I use. We start broad, like we want to kind of summarize like I did today. Um, you know, we're going to talk about monologues, why it would matter to you, because we, we know. And then we're going to go we're going to go narrow. So now I'm narrow. Now I'm talking about specific strategies, stories, being unpredictable, being vulnerable, making sure that the audience is the hero. And then in the end, what you want to do is you want to summarize your message again, and then you want to lay it back out as a gift. And that's when you connect the audience to what your experiences are. So I'll give you the example of the person I was writing the speech for as to, to answer your question, how do you do that? The, the, the story was about continuing to fight when you feel like you have nothing left in your tank. And she kept telling these stories about her fight and her life and how she overcame that and continued on. Well, toward the end of it, the, the, the story stopped being about her and they started being about we and us. We are warriors. And she started focusing on what they are fighting for. So at the end of it, that she was part of their team. So the stories and the relatable emotions and relatable experiences, like my experience, for example, with the trauma of my daughter all these years, few people have that experience, but so many people can relate to the heartbreak of a mother. So many people can. So know your audience and then relate what you are sharing to their lives. If you're speaking to all lawyers, for example, then you're going to want to be very specific to taking what you're sharing about your vulnerable story and applying it specifically to their work and their lives. Does that make sense? Totally does. Yeah, I love that. And that de that description of like my story, my fight, and then we are all warriors. And that really does help because people do start to tune out if you're talking about yourself too much because everybody's thinking about themselves, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's what's so um, heartwarming about the people that come on the daily huddle to me is no one's forcing you to get up and be here. You are the people that have decided, I want to learn something today. I want to grow. I want to get better. And you show up here with that mindset. But not all audiences are like you. And when because you're made that way, you it might be easy to make the assumption that other people are like you, but a lot of people are like my husband. <laughs> he crosses his arms when a motivational speech or speak, speaker or, or anybody that has any kind of 
message about themselves. He has to really, really trust to be open to learning and growing. That's great. I think you kind of just did it right then. You're talking about how to do it. And then you opened it up to the whole audience and talked about how like these people who come on, like we are all here for the same reason. So it's interesting to watch that. And I don't know if you meant to or not, but it, it's what it felt like to incorporate everybody and go, oh, we're all part of the same group. Everybody wants to belong. Like we are all learners and growers. And suddenly it's like, I feel part of the group even more. Mm-hmm. So is that a part of it as, as having, having there be that sort of unified group feeling like we are all warriors or we are all learners? Is that a part of this? Um, yes. And as a matter of fact, there's, there's science to back that up. So you remember when, um, uh, what are they called? Like ropes courses were like a big thing for team building. They got so popular. Well, the reason why they work is because when a group or a team of people experience something super risky, it bonds them. It is an mm. instant ability to bond when something feels scary and uncomfortable and you overcome it together. That's why those things have, you know, are popular because it, it elevates that vasopressin and oxytocin in the brain and builds a bond that's impenetrable. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to take a little break here, not a break, but I'm going to share a screen because I have an example of one of the best monologues I've ever seen. And then I will dissect it just a little bit with you all and we'll have some time for some questions. So I am going to share this screen and it's broken into two parts. Um, So I'm going to, let's see, share sound and let you all enjoy this. You can see the screen, right? We can. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia. Okay, stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Roberts. Less is more. I wish someone had told me that. And so it began. Though this is not just a case of humble beginnings and working hard, there are some who have a gift. And then there are those who have a gift who are further propelled by people who believe in them. And such is the case for Denzel Washington. And here is the proof. This is a letter of recommendation. It's written for young Denzel when he was graduating from Fordham University and needed somebody to vouch for his talents. They are words so encouraging, so inspiring that Denzel folded it up and put it in his wallet and carries the original with him to this day. He's probably sitting on it right now. (laughs) Take a look at this. You can see down there in the corner, it is signed by Robert Stone, Denzel's teacher and actor of great acclaim in his own right. Here are just a few lines. I say without hesitation that Mr. Washington is the finest young actor I have ever known. At age 22, he has a potential for being one of the outstanding actors of the latter part of the 20th century. If there is such a thing as genius, then I assure you, Mr. Washington is one, and God only knows where this can take him. All right, there's one more part I want you to see, and this is the end. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Roberts. Here it is. I don't know. It's not cooperating today. Sorry. Here we go. Well, Denzel, it has taken you here tonight to the AFI Life Achievement Award, surrounded by your friends and amazing family having to sit still and listen to heaps and heaps of praise and deserved attention. And I know how comfortable and happy that makes you. (laughs) So every time I see that, and I've used it a couple of times in my workshops, um, it puts the biggest smile on my face. And I want to unpack it for you, then I would love to hear your reaction. And I want to tell you why I find it so, so masterful. And I'm going to start with the ending, because that's when I get this giant smile. There's something that we forget to do when we're asked to speak. And 
I call it being embodied. Whether she was acting or not, we will never know. She is a great actress. But at the very end, she wasn't talking to anybody in that room but her buddy Denzel. And then she let herself laugh with all of her body, so much so that she even sighed at the end of the laugh. That made her so real. There was not a person in that room who was not hanging on her every single word. So let's talk about why that is. She did exactly what I recommended in the beginning. She came out and said something very unpredictable. She didn't say, good evening, I'm happy to be here. I, I forgot what she said, but it was super unpredictable. She only had a few minutes, right? She worked on this. Now, she was reading it from a teleprompter. I could tell because I know this world, world um, but every single word was curated. And when we only have a few minutes, we owe it to the listeners to prepare enough that we are that we must value their time so much that we work and we prepare. Every word was curated. She did something else. She told a story about Denzel Washington that made him like a real dude. Like it's Denzel Washington who has this little letter that he walks around and keeps in his back pocket that made him feel relatable. Like, wow, he's a regular guy. And then in the end, did that not inspire you? We're not Denzel Washington. We're not actors. But she made it about the audience because it was a very, very inspiring message. Oh, and, and another thing she did, which I forgot to mention, is she had that visual. Think about how less powerful it would have been had she read the letter without the visual. She could have just read the letter, right? But seeing that real authentic letter up on that screen, that just really, really drove it home. So I would love to hear in our last few minutes what you all think about giving a monologue. If you have questions, if you have thoughts about why you did or did not like Julia Roberts' masterful toast to Denzel Washington. Cece, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I love the way she came out with such confidence. And she didn't just make it all about herself. I, I am working on that because I couldn't have done that by myself and I know she had a team to help her and I think this is a most uh, excellent topic for this this morning and it's something for me to work on and thank you. Yeah thank you Cece thank you very much yeah it, it takes work and when I write speeches um, they don't just pop out in 10 minutes like I'll work on it and then I'll bring it back but always always forever focusing on making it not about the speaker but about the listeners. Sorrel good morning. Good morning Tara. Uh, talk to the brain never ceases to amaze. <laughs> oh, uh, what I got today is that uh, giving a monologue or speaking is not like a recipe. You can't begin and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something unpredictable at the beginning, then I'm going to tell a story, then I'm going to do that, and then it's going to be perfect. Uh, at the very end, when you were speaking, I got, oh, my God, to create a piece of speaking and to really be like embracing the audience as you envision before you speak, I could treat every monologue like a brand new recipe just for the palates of this audience, but no other audiences. Mm. So, uh, you know, maybe a two minute monologue might take two weeks to prepare. Absolutely. As I, as I work not to figure out what's gonna make it sound good, but what is actually going to uh, fulfill an intention for the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, it leaves me touched and moved. Like, I, I, I can't wait to go love a group of people that way. Oh, I'm so glad. I, um, you, you're 100% right. And if it's helpful, I'll tell you how I kind of unpack when I'm helping speakers. And it is that I first ask them the big question, like, the, you remember I said broad, like, what is the one thing you want to give to this audience? The one thing. Okay, now let's give, let's give that three subheadings. Like, what are the reasons why that's that's your message? Then I asked the powerful question, okay, tell me times in your life that 
helped you to experience this. And that's where we unfold the stories and then we pack it all back together. And then, as I mentioned, in the end, we gift it, right? It is all about the audience. Rashida. Good morning, good morning, everyone. This is Rashida on my way to New York. It's not driving, my wife is driving, so <laughs> I'm the passenger today. And it's funny that uh, I love the topic, love it dearly. And one of the things that I have learned as a motivational speaker that I am, um, Toastmaster recipient, is that uh, what I really enjoy is the table topic that Toastmaster teaches, that we have two minutes to tell your story. And trust me, when they give you that two minutes, you have two minutes to tell your story. And one of the things that when I, I do any speak, when I engage um, to go and do a speech and they introduce me, I no longer introduce myself. I say, uh, the way I introduce myself and the way I start my speech, I say, please do not kill the messenger. I'm here to give a message and I'm leaving. And it's up to you if you want to take the message and use it and utilize it, but I am out of here. And with that, <laughs> I'm telling you, and it, immediately I get I get everybody engaged because they want to know what is the message that I have to engage with mm -hmm. to get the message or the, the point across. Don't kill the messenger. I'm only here <laughs> to leave a message. And with that, that's what that's what I use every time I get on the stage to be able to um, impart to give that that clue because mm -hmm. it's it, remember they give me two minutes to 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 engage with with everybody in the audience and with mm -hmm. that i'm out but i'm still here thank you <laughs> yeah that's so cool i um i used to do toastmasters and interestingly um you know you have a six minute talk in Toastmasters when you're one of the featured speakers. And the first time I ever did talk to the brain was when I actually coined that phrase was at Toastmasters and the talk was called talk to the brain. And when I sat down, somebody said to me, he said, that's some Ted talk shit right there. <laughs> and that was the birth of the, of the phrase talk to the brain. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh uh, yeah. So do we need a summary or any other questions or comments, or do y'all want me to kind of summarize this for us? I would love to hear it summarized. Um, yeah, let's do yeah, that. Yeah, I think that probably is helpful. So I, I made a, a couple of little notes here and I just want to review them. So remember that our listeners don't fear survival anymore, but they do fear complexity, boredom, and the unknown. So take care of your audience. Make some assumptions about what they might fear and set their mind at ease. That builds a sense of bonding and trust and puts them in a place where they're going to really want to receive your message. And then throughout your talk, no matter how short or long it is, make sure and share some stories because that keeps people engaged. Short, short stories, not long journeys. A story is a moment in time, a, a transformative moment in time. Make it vulnerable, but then take those emotions, take that experience and make it a gift to your audience. Always, always make it a gift about them. Remember, when we are giving a monologue, we are giving. That's the word. We are there to serve. We're there to give, to live in that moment, be ourselves, and make sure that we're giving a gift to those who are listening and that they leave, hopefully, with something that can help them to experience life a little bit better than they, than they were yesterday. So with that, I think I'll close this out if there are no other questions. This has been so much fun. I hope it's been helpful and interesting to you all. And I am always delighted to end with our seven tenets. And I will start with love because that's the word that really inspires me when I open my big fat trap. So keep loving, keep giving, give of your time, of your heart, of your talents, throw your head back just like Julia Roberts did and let that laugh go. Let those endorphins fly, get your sleep, stress less, eat those plants, take care of that body. And how do we do that? Move that body. Thank you all. We'll see you next time on the Daily Huddle. See y'all tomorrow. One love, guys. Have a great day. It was awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Peace.